Hello, I have a couple of Sony J3 digital beta cam players. These are quite handy because as well as playing digital beta cam tapes, they can also play analog beta cam SP, even beta cam oxide in both NTSC and PAL. One of my machines has an SDI output, pure digital data stream, the other doesn't. The data stream is quite useful, especially for recording from digital tapes, but it's a high data rate and not everyone needs that kind of file format could be handy to have uh, a machine which had a, a firewire output for a DV stream, which sometimes is all that's needed. I also, by the way, have a Sony JH3, which is a high definition HD cam machine. Now there was a machine made, you know, which does have a firewire output. I've always quite fancied one. It was called the Sony J30. And as well as that firewire output, it also has a uh, uh, infrared remote control option. So I've always quite fancied the J30, but they do seem to fetch rather a lot of money still. Something's just arrived. Oh, wonderful! It's the Sony J30. Non-working, but let's see if we can fix it. I've always wanted one of these. And this has more output connectors, including the firewire output. So uh, that's quite useful, that. So here's the machine. Uh, it's cosmetically uh, not the best. A little bit of damage there, lots of scratches on the top. Uh, it apparently was working and then suddenly stopped working. Um, just not taking any functions or anything. So, and I'm a bit concerned about the damage here. That's really interesting. Big scratch there. This has led a hard life, hasn't it? But uh, let's power it up. I haven't, I genuinely haven't tried it. So let's see what, if anything happens. Plugged into my isolation transformer, switch on. It's off there, so I'll switch on the transformer, and now switch this on. I wouldn't say nothing. I think I heard a faint, faint sort of clunk. Try that again. Yes, there's a very faint clunk. Okay, let's take the lid off and have a look. Oh, there's already screws missing, and I don't think these are the original screws. Hmm. Okay, I'll power it up again and see if we can work out where that clunk is coming from. Uh, just a, a relay, I think, and I saw some lights come on on the PCB at the back. There's activity here. I don't suppose it would take a tape, would it? Oh, it will. Hmm, sort of. In that respect, it's behaving like the spools are in the outmost position, but they are in, in as they would need to be for the small tape, as you can see there. No display, it feels a bit like a power supply fault, doesn't it? But I suspect it's not. Right, I've connected this old TV to the composite with superimposed uh, graphics output to see if we get anything on the display which might give us some clues, such as an error message. Well, we have some video signal because it's gone black, but that appears to be all. If I put a tape in, does anything appear on the screen? No. I tried to call it the menu, nothing. So the front panel appears to be dead and what knock-on effect that's having, we can't be sure. So let's have a look at the front panel and see if we can detect some voltages on there. That connector's a little bit loose, let's just reseat that. That's really quite loose. There's a warning here that there's 50 volts on here, and that sounds about right because there is a VFD type display here. So I need to find where the voltages are. There's a fuse here, and I'll just check that one. That's okay. There's a capacitor here, 
marked 22 microfarad 50 volt. Let's measure what voltage is across that. Okay, I think I'm set on the pads. Let's measure the voltage. It appears to be nothing. So that's why we have nothing on the display. So maybe it is a power supply fault. We'll have to get the schematics. There's a um, cover here for the power supply, which when we remove, allows us to get to this 60 way connector, which is the output from the power supply. You can see that. Now I don't have the schematics for this machine, but I do have this, the, at least some of the information for the J3. And it looks from a few DC checks as though the power supply is very similar or the same. So we're going to go through and measure the voltages on that power supply going along with this connector and not making any mistakes and not uh, blowing anything up, I hope. They don't give you any schematics for the power supply. If it doesn't work, it says replace the power supply, which is desperately unhelpful. There are no high voltages, so that higher voltage for the front panel must be generated somewhere else, probably on the front panel. So I suspect the power supply is not the cause anyway, but let's go through it and uh, try to eliminate that. Yes, that for the first three pins. Then we have three grounds. And then we should have minus five volts. Correct. Then three more grounds. And then two five volt lines. And then a heap of grounds. And then at the end, 3.3 volts. Okay, I think I've eliminated the main power supply. Well, I've removed the uh, front panel electronics. The screws didn't feel done up very well. So this has likely been got at before. This is actually built by Futaba, who uh, make these uh, VFD display types. Um, her, there's something going on here. Let's look at this through the microscope. This has clearly been got at before because it didn't come out of the factory looking like that. I have only um, partial diagrams. It seems that because this panel is built by Futaba, like the power supply, Sony don't provide any service information on it. But uh, first thing I can do, since I do have the pin out for this connector, is just check whether we have some voltages. So the first thing uh, is to make sure our ground is connected. So pins eight and nine should be ground. Pardon, they're not. What about this ground point here? It is the same ground, isn't it? Well, if I don't have ground, nothing makes sense. Surely then this connector must be disconnected at the other end. Let's follow this connector. It's supposed to go through to panel MB919, which is going to be one of these. Let's check that cable. Right, the second to end to on this end are the grounds. Okay. Okay, so the two ground pins are near this end, which is here. So the cable was plugged in the correct way around, but maybe not fitted into the socket properly. So let's just check that, make sure we've got it all connected up properly. Okay, we have ground connected up. Let's just power it up a, another time, see if anything's changed. I don't think it has. And then we can go through the voltages. Just make sure there are plus 5 and 3.3 .3 volts on that front panel. Right, nothing's changed. Let's look for those voltages. So the pin at the end should be 3.3 .3 volts, so that should be a fairly easy one to find. Power up and look for 3.3 .3 volts. Well, it's sort of 2.93. Don't think that's going to be wrong enough to cause a problem. So we have two grounds and then we have what should be plus 5 volts. So let's check for plus 5 volts there. No. No plus 5 volts. OK, that would certainly stop it from working. So we need to go and find this board, this panel 
MB919. Something that's important when you're refitting the front is that this is fully open when you put it together. And I think the easiest way to do that is to put a tape in. And then you're guaranteed that this is properly fully open. Right, let's go and find this board MB919 or the other end of that connector. So the panel we want, MB919, is this big one at the back and the cable we need is CN500 which of course, because life's like that, is completely inaccessible. It's buried down there. I don't think taking the bottom off gets you anywhere but we'll have to have a look. Oh, well actually it does, just about. This is the connector. So we can confirm that there won't be any 5 volts on that connector. So it's pin 6 and 7 on there, we need to look for 5 volts. OK, I'm going to power up, so I'm going to work from the top end. So I should see 3.3, 2 grams and then 5 volts. So starting at 3.3, we know this one works. 3.2, that's fine. Then ground, ground, and five volts. We have five volts here. How can we have five volts at one end of that cable and not at the other for two conductors? Seems a little unlikely, doesn't it? It may be a damaged cable or it may just be not making good contact. Okay, the cable's good. So we're just not making good contact at the end for both of those connectors? Well, I just need to um, sort that out, don't I? Right, I've done some metering out and I think this connector is just terrible. I think we're losing and making and breaking connections in here repeatedly. So that is going to be either due to damage on this socket and or damage to the flexi cable. Okay, this cable wasn't fitted properly in the socket. It had surplus material at one end and cut off material at the other. So somebody's been fiddling with this bit of cable. I have now lined it up so that it does make proper contact with all the socket pins. Let's just see now if that's made any difference. That cable does appear now to be fully connected. Perhaps some damage has been done as a result of that falling out of its place though. But it all does appear to be there and we should be able to detect the 5 volts on the front panel now. And the best place to measure that 5 volts is actually at this fuse. So uh, let's see if we have 5 volts at that fuse. Nothing on the display. But we do have, I hope you saw that, we do have 5 volts on the fuse. I think you might just see that. So that's a certain amount of progress. This is now powered up. Perhaps now we can check again for any voltage on this uh, 50 volt rated capacitor, which would imply that the uh, DC to DC converter on this Futaba board is working. Now the thing you have to check note here is it's in minus 50 volts so the positive side of the capacitor is at ground so we'll be looking for minus 50 volts here. If we don't have minus 50 volts there then we will not have anything on the display. Well, it won't necessarily be 50 volts but some voltage. No, we have essentially nothing there. So the DC to DC converter on the display board is not working. I think then we might be slightly stuffed because this whole board is just considered a replaceable unit by Sony. Let's just reassemble this. And you might say, why did I want to reassemble it? Well, it's because having now got power to the front board, albeit the display is not working, I just want to see if the symptoms have changed at all. So my question would be, 
does a lack of display operation and possibly other functionality in the front panel stop the machine from accepting a tape? And we just don't know. I'm not sure what I'm going to be able to learn from this, but I think I'll have a look at the signals uh, that are going through this cable from the board at the back here to the uh, front panel because there's supposed to be uh, some clock and data signals there. Now, I don't know how much further forward I'll be if I find that they are or are not present, but uh, let's uh, scope them out anyway. So I'll try and get it set up so that you can see the scope as we go along. Okay, the machine is uh, powered up. Uh, you can see some lights flashing on the board at the back. Let's start with pin one, which looks like it should be a clock. And I don't know if you can see that. We seem to have clock, no clock. Well, actually, that doesn't look like a clock at all. It looks more like data. Bursts of data. That's an odd signal for a clock. Let's look at pin 2, which should be CMD. We're getting some messy signals on that. Looks like uh, multiple voltages. Really odd. Could be different devices talking to a bus. Pin 3 is RES, which I'll take it as reset. And that seems to have... Well, data on it. Very strange. Pin 4 is KYCS. I don't know what that stands for. But it's just a fairly low frequency pulsing in a millisecond area. And next one is RDY. So I'm guessing that's ready. One, two. And that's low going pulses. So they all have something on them even if I don't know what any of them mean. Well, we may have come to a bit of a sticky end on this, but I do have a little bit more information about the history of it. The machine was bought by the previous owner um, on eBay, and it didn't work initially. He found the display, and I think it was just the display didn't work. And he took the display off and found uh, a broken wire on that transformer that we saw earlier, the coil which generates a high voltage for the display. He resoldered that, so that's why there's a wire on there. But that is a separate problem. The whole machine died on him later. It was not as a result of something to do with that, because when that wasn't working, the machine did still respond to the front panel, and now it's not responding to anything. So it looks like either something else has fell deep in the machine, or on the front panel. Now I just put a tape in and it went in, but it didn't sound right. Oh, but look, it's responded to the eject. Why is that working now? It didn't sound very happy when it went in, but it did run. Press play. Something's clattering away. And the tape tension's uneven. Let me see if we can get you to see that. Something's not right there. It may have just stopped with an error. Let's press rewind. No, I think it's probably gone out with an error, but we can't see, of course. Press eject. Well, it's doing more than it was before. 
Let's power cycle it. There's a red light here. I wonder if that's not normal. Let's power cycle it and see if that red light goes away. It does somewhat imply that that red light is a error message. Yes, that red LED is marked ERR. So there seems to be a mechanical problem as well as whatever's wrong with the display. But it appears now that it is just the display, not the whole of the front panel. That's just noisier than these machines should be. It hits fast forward. That's not full fast forward speed. Rewind. Play is dreadful. I suppose I can connect the monitor to it and see if we get a picture. It's a dreadful picture. Lots of errors. And we've got the red light on again. I don't think it'll do anything until we power cycle it to get rid of that red light. That noise, is it the capstan motor? I think it is. I think the capstan motor is making a dreadful noise. Right, so do I persevere with trying to fix the front panel or do I have a look at the capstan motor? Um, let's see if I can get any access to the capstan motor first. So it's going to be under this board. Okay, I have that board out. Now I can see the capstan motor, but of course I won't be able to run it with that board out. So all I can do is see if it's mechanically happy. No, it doesn't seem to be free to spin. What's wrong? Ah, it's a brake on. It's got a capstan brake. This seems a bit... Um, this brake mechanism looks a bit gungy and it's struggling a little bit. So I think I'll clean that up and oil it. Okay, that brake is working better now. Let's put that cover back on and make sure that's not binding on it too. Okay, that's okay. I'll put the board back on and then I'll just make sure that there's nothing on the top side that needs lubricating. I can't really get to the bottom of the capstan here and I don't want to start sticking oil and stuff in there where it doesn't belong. So let's just power it up again and see how it behaves now. Yeah, so it's still not a happy capstan. As it's making those noises, I can see the capstan twitching. It's like it can't get to the position it's trying to get to. And I'm just gently pushing it slightly, and it can instigate that noise and clear it. You know what that means, don't you? It's got a bad capstan motor. So we have two faults. 
the display is not lit but the machine wasn't running probably because it detected a problem with the capstan motor it wasn't running so when it took the tape in it ejected it because it couldn't get the capstan motor spinning up then by good luck it started to move and it was then able to accept the tape and mechanically kind of run so it's almost certainly a defective capstan motor and also uh, a bad display uh, driver we could have a go at fixing the display driver but there's no point is there because the capstan motors had it I'm sure it is I mean it could be the driver electronics but it's far more likely to be the motor itself so uh, it's probably come to the end of the road but it has been interesting working on it hasn't it while we're here let's uh, see if we can get into the menus yes we can so looking at some of the figures drum as 1055 it's pretty low considering how mashed up the machine is tape has 745 oh what a shame and it seems odd doesn't it that the um, capstan motors died on such a, a low as machine just in case there's a bad setting here and I'm sure there isn't I'm going to do a reset I think I can do one here press set, set button so I think that's done the reset let's just listen to that capstan motor again there's something terribly terribly wrong with that capstan is there any possibility that the brake has been is catching let me just check that because we did see a brake earlier here is the brake so I just need to make sure that that is off when it's in play and I can do that with the machine the right way around and just push on that brake just to make sure that that brake is not snagging for some reason right, it's in play and I've got my finger on that brake mechanism no it's definitely not that it's the capstan motor itself it was worth checking though. Well, it looks like I've come to the end of what I can do with this lovely Sony J30 deck. Uh, I really need a scrap machine to supply a capstan motor and a new front front panel. It might be that a Sony, uh, another machine like a Sony J3 would be able to provide me with a capstan motor, but the front panel may not be compatible, wouldn't have the infrared remote control and could even do damage so really I would uh, like to get hold of another J30 and possibly make one out of two if anybody has one uh, please let me know that uh, you know might give us a chance to get this going again now in the meantime I will be working hopefully the next video on this beautiful Philips VR2324 we made some progress with this recently we got it going from completely dead to doing something uh, and since then, lots of my viewers have given me great information, including schematics, albeit not in English, uh, and some pointers to the sort of things that can go wrong with these. So uh, I'll work on that. It's a Philips uh, V2000 format machine. So uh, please do come by and join me while we work on lots of other audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now. get back to a Philips VR2324 I've been working on. I have a few more schematics for that and hopefully I can have a little bit more progress with that than I've had with this. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I'll see you in the next video.